Hello, and welcome to episode 163 of Dark and Stormy Book Club. Today we have an interview with Caitlin Rother. Enjoy! I'm Ann Dark. I'm Tracy Stormy. And I'm Kathy Knight. And together we are... It Was a Dark and Stormy Book Club. A podcast for mystery lovers. Welcome! If you enjoy our show, please consider contributing to the Dark and Stormy Patreon. By becoming a patron, you will help us create better and quality content. There are also benefits to becoming a patron, such as exclusive content and Dark and Stormy merchandise. Become a supporter at patreon.com slash darkandstormybc. Check our website for the link. We appreciate any and all contributions. Thank you. Death on Ocean Boulevard is the story of the mysterious death of 32-year-old Rebecca Zahal, who was found hanging from a second-story balcony of her multimillionaire boyfriend's mansion in 2011. She was naked and gagged, with her ankles tied and the hands bound behind her. On the door of her bedroom, investigators found a handwritten message she saved him can you save her the death was deemed a suicide but rother reveals there is much more to the story new york times best-selling author caitlin rother has written or co-authored over 14 books rother regularly appears as a tv crime analyst and speaker she also takes on a limited number of clients as a writing research promotions coach and consultant. Before quitting the news business to write books full-time, Rother worked for 19 years as an investigative reporter for daily newspapers, covering issues ranging from addiction, suicide, mental illness, and murder, to politics and corruption at City Hall, and in Congress. Rother was a Pulitzer-nominated staff writer for the San Diego Union Tribune and also has been published in Cosmopolitan, the Los Angeles Times, Washington Post, Chicago Tribune, Boston Globe, Daily Beast, and Huffington Post. She earned her bachelor's degree in psychology from the University of California, Berkeley, and her master's in journalism at Northwestern University. Her website is CaitlinRother.com. We would like to welcome Caitlin Rother to the program. She has a fascinating true crime story coming out called The Death on Ocean Boulevard. Welcome, Caitlin. Hi. I am a big fan of all true crime, but this case is one of the strangest cases I've ever <laughs> came across. Yeah, me and, too. And there's been some weird ones out there, but this one truly takes the cake. There are many examples of people acting abnormally under the use of Ambien. Why wasn't Adam's use of the popular sleep aid investigated and questioned more? That's a good question. I was wondering that too. I had heard before I got into this case that he had taken an Ambien, and I don't know exactly how I learned that, but I think it was somewhere in the media. When we got to trial, they didn't mention it at all. And I thought, well, that's kind of weird. So I went back through the court documents. There's something called an in limine motion. These are the motions that are filed before the trial starts. Well, now the different attorneys on both sides are arguing about what can be presented in court and what can't. And I found that Adam Shackney's attorneys fought against the Zahaus bringing that up in court. I think your question is about the investigation, though. I don't know if it was even investigated. Like I said, I don't remember exactly. I think he admitted it to the guy that did his polygraph examination, the lie detector test. I don't remember. It was probably during one of his conversations with detectives the day that he said he found her hanging and cut her down. That was my question, too. And I went and I looked online and Charlie Sheen, I think, was one of them who 
right. the whole hotel room, and then he blamed it on Ambien. Roseanne Barr said a bunch of stuff and then got herself in trouble, got herself thrown off the show she was on, and she blamed Ambien. I also found that there had been other court cases where the defense used the Ambien defense as they did stuff while they were, quote-unquote, asleep on Ambien and didn't remember it the next day, including murder. So I asked Adam that. He got upset about it when I first asked him and then actually canceled an interview that we had planned over that. So it's clearly a touchy subject. I guess the reason that the defense attorneys did not want that in court, there's so much controversy and bad publicity, essentially. And they said, oh, we don't want to get the jurors confused because, you know, it affects some people that way. It doesn't affect other people that way. I guess they probably also were thinking, well, we don't want to mention it because it doesn't matter whether he was on it or not because he wasn't in the house and he didn't kill her. So it would not be to their benefit. But I think it helped for the weird stuff he said. like. The reason I was confused is because I had taken an Ambien, and that's why I said, got a girl in the guest house. You know, he could have used it to his benefit, but I guess the defense attorneys just didn't want to bring it up at all because it could have gone either way. I think that's the best answer for that. I almost feel that the police were team Adam. Anything that was brought up seemed to be just pushed aside. I'm not going to take an opinion on that, but I will say that there are people who believe that he was not really investigated enough at all. And that, you know, they didn't take his phone and look at it. Jonas Shacknice, his brother, who was Rebecca's boyfriend, the owner of the home where she was found, they got his phone records, they got Rebecca's phone records. I don't think they got Adam's phone records and they didn't even look at his phone to see that he was where he was. And so that's been brought up by outside investigators, not with the Sheriff's Department, but people who've looked at this case. And I said the same thing, you know, that seemed like a no-brainer to me. If he's there and he's the only one there, and what a weird way to find her dead, why wouldn't they look at his phone? I, I don't know. That seemed like a hole in the investigation. Well, also, Adam was polygraphed. They deemed the results inconclusive, but outside experts said it clearly showed deception. Right. Why didn't Rebecca's family push for more tests? Well, Rebecca's family wasn't part of the investigation. They didn't get a say in anything. They complain to this day that the investigators didn't share anything with them. They feel like they shared with Jonah, Jack and I, information, but not with them. And I don't know whether that's true or not, but that's how they feel. But they didn't know that he had been polygraphed, I'm sure, for years until they filed a lawsuit and got into the discovery. They didn't say anything about it because I'm sure they didn't even know that he had been polygraphed and they didn't know the details of the test or what was said until once they got into the evidence analysis. Detectives don't share their investigation with anybody because it can compromise the investigation. So they purposely hold information back. So for example, the detectives purposely did not disclose the words that were painted on the door. They said there was a message, but they refused to release what the words actually were. I think the only way that anyone found out about that is because a bunch of TV channels and news organizations got together and filed some kind of court action to unseal the search warrant affidavits. And I think that's how they found out what the words on the door were. I might be wrong about that. I know that initially the detectives did not release that. And the reason they do that is because when they're questioning people of interest or suspects, which they were very careful in this case not to label anybody, I think Adam was a person of interest and that was it. But I don't think they had any quote unquote suspects. And they were very careful about that because that has some kind of ramification if you label somebody that way publicly, right? Because they want to see if people are lying. And so if somebody volunteers information about the scene, but they weren't there or they aren't supposed to know, then the the investigators are like, well, how does he know that, right? Maybe he was there, you know, that kind of thing. And that's why they don't share with the family. But the family felt that they should have been asked more questions about Rebecca. And they felt like they should have been included more, at least in terms of trying to get more information about Rebecca's state of mind. Also, another part that makes this very interesting is a female neighbor heard a scream, help me, help me, from a female. And the police commented that there was no way she could have heard because of her advanced age and how far away it was. Was this ever tested? Let's go back for a second. This lady 
was elderly and she lived two doors down. She was listening to the TV. She was interviewed by the police several times and then she was deposed by the attorney some years later. And her story kept changing. I think what probably happened, she said that there was one female detective. She didn't like the way she talked to her. And she was the one who said, oh, you couldn't have heard that. I don't think the detective gave her a reason why. I don't know about her age or anything. I think it was more about what room she was in and which way it was facing. But I wasn't there. So I don't know exactly what was said. I think she said it was a blonde detective. Except I think the only detective that was a female that was there was a dark-haired detective. I think there were some credibility issues from the sheriff's standpoint. And she seemed a little confused. You know, sometimes people want to help. Their memories change sometimes. The answer to your question is no, it wasn't tested. And I think the reason it wasn't tested is because they felt there was a credibility issue there. I think that they just thought, well, the room's facing towards the street and the courtyard where Rebecca was supposedly hanging was in the rear. So how could she have heard that? The detective was on the stand and asked that question. And I think he just said that he had suggested doing it and then it just never got done. It was like there were other priorities. I think it would have been good for them to try it, honestly, just to be thorough, but they didn't. Yeah, that even if she did have some challenges as far as credibility, that it just would have been nice to know, is it possible? Right. And they could still do that right now. (laughs) Yeah. I called up the real estate agent. The house was on the market for years. Couldn't sell, couldn't sell. Finally sold. I didn't even know it was sold. I luckily found out before I turned in the very last version of the the galleys. I was able to fix that. And I wanted to go take a look at the house and go inside and walk around because it was vacant, right? And the real estate agent was like, no, 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 you can't do that. I think they just wanted to remove the taint as much as they can because, you know, the locals were calling it the murder house. Now, who wants to buy the murder house? It's on the market. You know, they just want the story to go away. Then I think someone also said, well, no one actually died in the house, which is true. true. I never thought about it that way. Yeah, the little boy, Max, who fell two days before Rebecca was found dead, he actually was unresponsive when the paramedics got there and they brought him back. He wasn't declared dead for another five days. He had been down for almost 30 minutes before they were able to bring him back with a second shot of epinephrine and a lot of CPR. There's some debate over whether Rebecca really did CPR or much of it. According to Jonah, she told him that she gave Max a few breaths, which is very different from doing CPR. And when you listen to the 911 tape, her little sister, who I've given a pseudonym in the book because she was so young, was calling 911 and Rebecca was yelling out instructions to her while they were on the phone. So I think it's hard to be calling out instructions for a CPR. So it's not really clear how much CPR she was really able to give. Boy, she was crying. She sounded really, really upset. This case all over is one of the strangest I've ever read, Mm -hmm. and I have a million questions. (laughs) Rebecca was living with a rich man, but she was also playing the field with other previous lovers. Any of the other investigators come up with any more suspects? Well, first of all, she wasn't, to my knowledge, seeing anybody while she was with Jonah. Is that what you meant? Yeah. Yeah. So Wasn't she in contact she... with her ex-husband? And Oh, yeah. He was texting her, but I don't think that they were seeing each other. He filed for divorce, and it went through while she was with Jonah. And she did not ever contest anything or file anything, even though she told her family that she was the one who had filed. And she told her ex-boyfriend in previous years that she was just waiting for the paperwork to go through. And in fact, neither one of them had filed. So. You know, there were a lot of stories that she told about the divorce, but she was not seeing anybody, to my knowledge. Her ex-husband was still in love with her and always wanted to be back with her. But what he said was that he finally filed a divorce because she was with Jonah. He knew he couldn't compete with Jonah. He had no money like that. She'd already had another boyfriend in the past who was rich that she left him for. She did see other men while she was married, but as to my knowledge, wasn't seeing anybody while she was with Jonah. And you asked, do I think there are any other suspects? So remember I said earlier that the sheriff's department was very careful not to label anybody a suspect because they're saying it's a suicide. The only person who has been found in court to be considered a suspect is Adam Shacknai. There's no evidence 
according to his defense team and according to him that he